Hey everyone, welcome to Write On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today we have an interview with Lauren Schmidt Hisrick, showrunner of The Witcher. Something has changed, Geralt. The world's acting strange these days. The North and South are war. Monsters roaming when they should be hibernating. Maybe it's the end of days. Are you willing to sacrifice your life? I've lived through three supposed end of days. It's all horseshit. This continent was meant for no one. None of us will have any peace until there are no monsters left in the world. Lauren and I discussed her approach to writing genre stories, what she looks for when hiring a writer's room, what she learned from Aaron Sorkin while working on The West Wing, and more. Check it out. Well, Lauren, thank you for taking the time to chat today. Of course. For the uninitiated, how would you describe The Witcher? (laughs) <laughs> Way to start with a really small question. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the, the log line of The Witcher that I always led with from the moment I pitched it right up to now is that it's a story about three orphans coming together to form a family. And I think what's interesting about that log line is it doesn't mention magic or monsters or sword fights or, you know, any really uh, of the hallmarks that I think people would say like, oh, that means it's the Witcher. But Mm -hmm. to me, that's the core of the story. And without the stories of of Geralt, Ciri and Yen first in their own spheres and learning, you know, to be the best Witcher, to be the best sorceress, to be a, a princess of a huge kingdom, really digging into those characters separately and then starting to smash them into each other and have them intersect in unexpected ways and learn to trust each other and love each other and need each other. I mean, to me, that is like the core focus of The Witcher. And and heading into season two, as a writer, as a showrunner, how does your objective sort of change? You know, now you've laid some groundwork, the audience is more familiar with this family dynamic. What is, you know, heading into season two, what opportunities does that afford you as a storyteller? I think you you kind of hit it right there, which is that season one was a lot of setup. You know, I think I've, I've made the analogy of setting the chessboard. You know, there was a lot to initiate the audience to. So, you know, who these character are, characters are, what their jobs are, how they're viewed in the world of The Witcher, how they're viewed on the continent, what the various kingdoms are, the, you know, sort of the political game that's being played, you know, in media race when we join. All of that had to be done to sort of understand the stakes of the series. And I feel like that groundwork was laid. So now we actually just get to do the the play chess. We get to actually play. And it afforded us so many great things as storytellers because we didn't have to worry about constantly using our time to set up, set up exposition. We could literally just have our characters off to the races. So for instance, I think the Geralt and Ciri storyline at the beginning of the season, this is Geralt taking the princess that he is newly in charge of. He is basically a stranger to her. They don't know each other. They don't trust each other yet. They've just heard that they're each other's destiny, but what does that even mean? He takes her to his childhood home. And I think this affords us so much great storytelling because it's like in real life, how do you get to know someone? You, you meet their family, you meet who they are when they're back with the people, you know, from whence they came. And you get to see Geralt as a brother, as one of this sort of brotherhood of witchers. You get to see him as a son to Vesemir. You start to understand why he was really quiet in season one and why now he has to start being more, more verbal, why he has to start being more vulnerable and open to Siri to get her to trust him. You know, all of those character things are kind of laid in. And I think without the work of C- Season one, we wouldn't be able to enjoy them. Now we just get to dig in and let these characters enjoy each other and we get to enjoy them. I want to talk about the scale of the show because I mean, I think audiences over the last you know few years with shows like Game of Thrones, their expectations for how you bring these big, huge fantasy worlds to life have only you know grown and talk about in the writing especially how do you you know kind of imagine these things how do you know when if you're going too far or is that not even a consideration you know when you guys are having these conversations about how the story is taking shape you know when you were dealing with the scale of it how does that affect the writing you know it's a great question and one of the things that i had to learn 
learn uh, the hard way really early on is that if everything is big, nothing means anything anymore. So now we look at episodes and we start to talk about not just what the story is of the episode, but what the sort of um, visual temples are, what the dramatic temples are, or do those things align in an episode where there is, for instance, a huge fight for Geralt. Um, I'm thinking specifically of episode six of this season where he fights with the Michelet brothers. We called it the library fight. It's huge. I mean, he is fighting his way through five humans, a lot of blood, a lot of destroyed furniture, um, all while trying to get to Siri. And we knew that that needed to be the highlight of the episode. So then the rest of the episode you look at and you say, okay, you know, there are other sort of small skirmishes, but if they start to compete with that, then, then we're going to lose the balance of the episode. So we're always bringing that into consideration. Yes. As much as you think you want everything to be huge, you want everything to be on the side of a mountain. If you start doing that, you risk losing the intimacy of the storytelling as well. And I think that's something that we did incredibly well. Uh, COVID, frankly, helped us with this this season because <laughs> we had some limitations about what we could shoot and how many people could be in a room. And, you know, we were suddenly faced with a very difficult schedule to keep. And so, for instance, scenes that may have been between two people, you know, galloping on horses suddenly became two people sitting in a tent. And this scenes benefited from that because you just got to stand still and have those quieter moments. It is always a balance and always something we consider in storytelling. That's really interesting. Did you have a, what was your relationship to the existing, you know, Witcher IP before you started the show? Were you a fan already or was it something where you dug in before you got started? I was a fan of The Last Wish, which was the only book that I had read at the time that Netflix approached me. I read it as a, you know, as a reader, basically not as someone who was thinking about adapting it. It had been suggested to me by a friend specifically because the person thought that I would like uh, some of the female roles in, in the, the series. And so I, I read it. I enjoyed it. Netflix came to me, you know, about a year later and said, have you ever thought about adapting this? I said, nope. <laughs> you know, but I started to dig in more then. And Blood of Elves was actually the next book that I read and then, then reversed and read Sword of Destiny. And I have to say, it was this idea of found family that really got to me when I was telling you about that sort of initial mm-hmm. log line. When I started to read it, I realized that, okay, I'm not sure that I'm ever going to be the best person to bring a huge epic fantasy to life. But if you boil the fantasy down and see it as a family story that then has amazing, fantastical world around it, well, that's a story that I know I can dig into with my soul. So then I did. Uh, At the time, though, it's funny that you used the the phrase Witcher IP because I kind of knew there was a video game. I'm not much of a gamer. My kids are eight and 10 now. They're just starting to become aware of more video games, but it was not part of my world at all. So I actually begged a friend to let me like drink a beer and watch him play The Witcher 3, uh, which was my my sort of first experience of it. And what I took from that is how beautiful the world was. It's really interesting. I think fantasy has gotten a bad rap for just being sort of dark and dingy these days. How often do you hear the phrase medieval fantasy? It's like like there's not another type. And the truth is, is that the witch world is quite gorgeous at times. I mean, part of the beauty of Sapkowski's books is that these horrible things are happening. And yet you'll have someone, you know, sort of rhapsodizing about a sunset, how beautiful it is. And it's like, how do these things coexist? And the truth is, is like, that's, that's real life. There's a lot of dark stuff happening around us, especially now we can relate to that. And yet, you find the things that bring you joy. You find the things that you can still be hopeful about. You find your friends and family. And Mm -hmm. I really got that from the Witcher game. The world that CDPR created was so beautiful. And so when talking to our production designer and our costume designer, talking about really finding places to to put beauty in, because I think it's just part of the the great contrast of the Witcher world. Obviously, you're making a, a television show both for fans of the existing property, as well as people who've never heard of it, or, you know, don't have too much experience with it. How does that affect your approach to, you know, handling this dense mythology, this huge world? Does it affect the way you build out your writer's rooms? How how does it, you know, how does that work for you? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for asking about the writers. Um, You know, a lot of people don't ask about the writers, but it absolutely does. So when I was putting together the writer's room for for season one, season two, and season three, I look for a real mix of people. I think that everyone has to love genre somehow. Everyone has to be able to, to tell me that they love science fiction. They love fantasy. They love comic books. They love something, something that feels not, uh, not of this world necessarily. But 
I didn't want to stack the decks with all book fans, you know, who were worshiping Sapkowski and his work, nor did I want to stack the deck with just all, you know, video game fans. I also needed people who, like me, didn't know much about The Witcher uh, when they first came in. They needed to love it by the time that they came onto the show, but I wanted them to grow and, and learn and love it, you know, as part of their journey on this show. So I think that I'm asked a lot about pleasing all of these fan groups because, as you said, they come at it from so many different different directions. I think that we could go terribly wrong trying to only please book fans uh, because no book to screen adaptation is going to be one for one, nor should they, by the way, they're completely different formats. Obviously, if we try to just please video game fans, the video games are an adaptation themselves. So now we're going to adapt an adaptation. That's not going to work either. I think I always think about keeping all of those fans in mind while also laying out a world that people who've never heard of The Witcher can follow, you know, and can enjoy. And the way that I did that alongside the writers was to make sure that any person that wanted to watch the show felt like they were represented in the show. So obviously, I think it's pretty obvious when you when you look at the show, we have cast a wide, diverse net in terms of our, our actors, you know, but also just sort of making sure that the female stories are as interesting as the male ones, um, that all of our characters are deeply layered, not just the protagonists. It's I think there's so many different things that come into it, but hopefully anyone that watches the show can find themselves in it. You know, you mentioned for this story, kind of the family dynamic was, was what, you know, drew you in. You've all, but you've also worked on other sort of genre stuff, Umbrella Academy, you worked, you know, some Marvel stuff. I'm curious, what is it about these genre stories that attracts you? Is it being able to sort of use the genre to tell family stories? How does that, you know, how does that work for you? When I was offered the job on Daredevil, which was my first, I mean, my first of many things, my first genre show, my first show with Netflix. I had embarrassingly never even read a comic book before then. I was such a genre newbie. And I actually admitted that in my interview and thought, wow, have I messed this up? Um, <laughs> I should have just lied and then gone home and studied everything. I think it's a really interesting thing because I think you take someone like me, who's completely new to this world. And you say, okay, I love this material. I love Daredevil, especially the, the my first episode on that show introduced Elektra, who very quickly became a favorite character of mine. So these are stories that I love, but also how do I make sure that, they're, that they are not just made for fans who already know the material? How can they start attracting other people? And to me, that's sometimes using you know your head to go, huh, okay, that makes sense in a comic book, but does it make sense in our world? Or is it going to you know start keeping going like, oh my God, that literally that could never happen. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they have to suspend disbelief that often, they're out of the show. So it really is that balance of, I think, being a, a person who's only write, written scripted drama about real life. I mean, I came off the West Wing. You couldn't have been, I mean, there's there are fantasy aspects to the West Wing as well, for sure. You know, but we, we were really close to, obviously, our real political system. And then going into something like Umbrella Academy that has almost zero tethers to our real world. What I will say that those shows gave to me, though, is a chance to sort of let my shoulders down and relax and not overthink. Speaking of Umbrella Academy specifically, there is so much wackiness in that show. And I say that with the greatest respect. I love it. I think it is so <laughs> insane and over the top in so many different ways. And that's been really helpful on The Witcher. You know, some of my favorite headlines in season one on reviews were like, it's bonkers, you know, like <laughs> it's wacky because that really is The Witcher world. I always say to people who are like, oh my God, I can't believe how crazy it is. I'm like, just wait till we introduce the unicorn. We are <laughs> introducing a unicorn. It it allowed me to kind of, um, as I said, lower my shoulders and just go, you know what? There's a real place for fun in this world too. Taking kind of a step backwards, you mentioned the, you know, you're working on the West Wing. How did you first know you wanted to be a storyteller? And then, you know, how did you find your way into, you know, being a work and television writer? I have always been a storyteller. My mother would tell you that in second grade, I got in big trouble. I wrote a story. We were all writing stories based on some sort of picture prompt. And I wrote a story that apparently was a little too edgy for my second grade classroom <laughs> in Ohio. And I got scolded in front of the other kids. My parents got called to the classroom. And I remember at the time thinking, but it's just my imagination. Like, like, why am I getting in trouble for this? And by the way, now I have an eight-year-old who tells the exact same stories. And you're like, it's not appropriate at school. <laughs> so I was always a storyteller, but I never thought of it as a job. I actually went to 
college pre-med, uh, assuming that I would be a doctor because that's a good, successful career. And, you know, I like school. I like to study. And I always just wrote on the side. And it was actually my English professor who pulled me aside at some point and said, have you ever thought about doing this for real? Like not mm-hmm. just as, you know, a hobby. And I said, my parents would kill me. And yet about six months later, I changed my major to uh, English literature with a focus on creative writing. Even that though, I still kind of thought that I would end up teaching English. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to write in my spare time. I wanted to teach writing to other people. Between my junior and senior years of college, I came to Los Angeles for fun. I have family that lives out here. I thought I will just come spend my summer out here as opposed to getting a summer job, (laughs) just hang out. Turns out I'm really bad at hanging out and doing nothing. So (laughs) after after about two weeks, a family friend said, we're starting up a a television show. You know, does Lauren want to come answer phones? At the time I was like, well, one, yes. I mean, the show could have been anything and I would have come and answered phones because that seemed so glamorous and exciting and not open world. That show was The West Wing. And it had obviously, it had just been bought. The pilot had had been made and it had been picked up. And so I joined right as they were writing episodes two and three. They were the very first television scripts I ever laid eyes on. Aaron Sorkin was such a writing mentor to me in terms of how he told story. And I went back, finished college and moved right back out to Los Angeles, picked up on the show and stayed there until it wrapped for good. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Can you just talk a little bit about what you learned from Aaron Sorkin during your time there? I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's hard to distill into a 30 second soundbite, but I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about it. It is hard to distill, but what I would say is that from Aaron, I learned an absolute love for language. There are times that you would forgive something from, for being too optimistic or for being like, people don't actually talk like that, or no one's going to be able to talk like that for that long without someone interrupting them. Or, you know, an argument is never that beautifully choreographed. Mm -hmm. And yet sometimes we want to watch an argument that that's beautiful, that is that beautifully choreographed. He has such a love for the words themselves, for the rhythm, for how they sound. When I was a writer's assistant one time, one of my jobs was editing scripts and I did so. And I changed a word thinking that he had forgotten something and it shot. And afterwards he got, he was like, who did that? And I realized like it was one word. It didn't change the meaning of the sentence, but it changed everything in his mind because it didn't sound the same. He has such a joy around writing. And I think, you know, when he left and John Wells took over, I started to learn a lot of the business of television, of production and and those sides. But from Aaron, I really learned the passion for the words. What's your writing process like? You know, I mean, I know you're a showrunner, so your responsibilities are extremely divided. But, you know, when you're just starting out on something... Are you a big outliner? Do you set deadlines for yourself? How do you operate? Yes, I definitely need deadlines. I need to have dates in front of me. The very first thing I do in the writer's room is distribute a schedule. It goes out on day one. It has every single date listed for every single, you know, outline, script, revision, everything, you know, to me, to Netflix. And we adhere to that really intensely because to me, the the best way to preserve our creative process is to put some boundaries around it, you know, and to make sure that we don't just wait for like chaos to take over because that's when the magic happens. No, magic is about planning. What I would say, I love the writer's room. I love to sit in there and have ideas bounce back and forth. The writers also know that at some point I'm like, okay, we're done. And I need to step out because I need absolute utter quiet to start processing all of those those ideas in my brain. And then, yes, I generally start outlining. I do not outline it really detailed um, unless I have to for another boss. But left to my own devices, I do a really sort of more like a beat sheet than an outline. And then I dive in because I like to sort of find the beginning and ends of scenes as I'm writing them. I can write either completely alone in my office, dead silence, or I can write someplace so loud, you know, in the middle of set with a bunch of things bust, you know, bustling around me, as long as no one's coming directly to me. <laughs> what I can't do is write to music. Music, I just I hear the lyrics. Or in a group of like small people who are doing things, it either has to be complete silence or complete chaos. <laughs> <laughs> can you just talk, talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, being a showrunner? Because I feel like a lot of people, you know, they understand what, what a screenwriter does, but may not totally understand a, the day-to-day responsibilities of a showrunner because you're not just in charge of writing scripts. Take us through, you know, a typical day in the life. 
Wow. A typical day in life. Well, that's something that showrunners do not have. <laughs> so we can start there. No, you know, I would say that I'm in charge of the, the overall creative vision of the show. So that starts with the scripts. Absolutely. You know, I, I run the writer's room when I'm in town. I have a, a number two, Mike Ostrowski, who runs the writer's room when I'm not there, who's incredible. You know, I sort of direct the vision of the show. But one of my personal ways that I like to run a room is that I don't ask everyone to sound just like me. I don't ask them to mimic my style. I want them each to own their own scripts very, very much because I feel like that's when the the passion comes across. If they're just trying to be me, then they're not going to be able to be passionately them. So, you know, then the creative process extends to hiring directors, hiring crew, making sure that they understand the creative vision. And then once we get into production, I think that There is still some oversight there. Again, I am, I hate micromanaging. I will not do it. I believe that I hire really amazing creative talents and then I need to trust them to do their jobs, to bring in their craft that is different than mine. So there is some oversight, but the thing that I think people don't understand about showrunners and the thing that I did not understand is just how much of it is about taking care of people. Once you get into production, you've got a show of of 400 some people, you know, at the most we carry a crew of about 800 people. And these are people who are all coming in with their own, obviously their own passions and thoughts and ideas, but they also just need to feel like they are being heard or being taken care of. And that is the thing that I had no concept of that a lot of my job is just listening, listening and making sure that people feel represented and heard, especially important during COVID. People were scared a lot. People wanted to talk about how they were doing, how their mental health was, their emotional health. And I needed to be there for that too. And I think, you know, that's the thing that is really hard to put your finger on because when you are taught to be a writer, you are not taught that the management of people is part of your job. In fact, you're taught that you're supposed to spend all of your time alone and you know, <laughs> just like give into the whims of inspiration. And it could not be less that Um, my job, as I said, is about schedule and timeliness and then about trying to be a service to the people around me. You mentioned a couple of times the challenges that COVID and the pandemic has presented to this season. Can you talk a little bit more about that specifically with the writer's room? I, I imagine the writer's room was virtual this season. How was that experience for you? I've talked to a lot of different showrunners and I've heard a lot of different things, but how did that work out for The Witcher? Interestingly, our room was not virtual because we had actually uh, finished our room about... It would be about four months before COVID hit. Oh, so okay. we were already into shooting season two by the time that we shut down. We were about three weeks into shooting it. So interestingly, it didn't impact the writer's room at all. And I'm so grateful because I have obviously, I mean, like everyone, I've spent the last two years of my life Zooming. And I think it's been really tough <laughs> on the creative process, especially for someone like me who, again, I like to stay engaged for a couple hours. And then I'm like, I need to be alone. Um, that's really difficult on Zoom. What I will say though, is it, it did impact the writing process a lot. But there were good parts and bad parts, you know, obviously, Obviously, we had just started shooting. We had just kind of hit our stride. Everyone's excited to be back and be back and be part of the team. And then suddenly you're like, and we're stopping and we're stopping for an unknown period of time. We all kind of laugh like everyone that when we left, we said goodbye. I was about to say we hugged, but there was no hugging. We waved goodbye. (laughs) And said, see you in a couple of weeks, having no idea that, you know, at the very least, I think I came back first um, from the U.S. to London where we shoot. And I'd been gone about five months. Most people were gone for six or seven. During that five months, I took the time to read all of the scripts, obviously, but not as individuals, but as this huge sort of eight hour long movie. And it was interesting because that's not something that television really affords us the time to do. And I actually started talking about when we were uh, beginning to plan out season three, how to, even without COVID, build in that reflection time, I called it, which is to get all the ideas out there, to have, you know, to basically to structure an entire season, to think about your major character arcs, and then to take space away from them come back to them after a while and see if they still feel like they're the most important stories to tell. Cause it's amazing. Sometimes, you know, as a writer, you will be in a writer's room. You'll be super passionate and duking it out about something. And a month later, you'll say, why did I care so much? Like, why was I so invested in that one tiny, like little thing? And so having that distance, I think we rewrote the scripts pretty heavily at that point, you know, both from not so much a story perspective, actually, as much as a character perspective, we tried to take every opportunity we could to just dig deeper into all the characters. Henry especially had a lot of thoughts over, over COVID about Geralt's journey. So we, you know, really sort of dug in there and made sure that we were telling that story the right way. But that is a silver lining and has 
honestly, it like has changed the way that I will structure a room from here on out. You use the phrase, you know, eight hour movie. And I feel like that's something that is, that's a new concept to the, to the streaming era, you know, versus a show like the West one where you're doing 22, 24, you might have an ongoing story arc, but the episodes themselves are fairly discreet. I'm curious, you know, when you look at this, when you're approaching the season of Witcher and it sounds like this has changed a bit, how do you kind of find the right balance of, okay, this episode tells its own story versus it also needs to tell, be a chapter in this larger story we're telling. How is that different on a show like this versus, you know, like something like the West Wing where, you know, again, it's a more typical uh, broadcast television show. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly it, which is that, you know, we spend a lot of time making sure that episodes feel, feel like they stand on their own, you know, which is how we watch them in editorial. So I don't ever watch it all eight episodes in a row. You know, we basically uh, work on one episode at a time, we lock it and we move on to the next one. So they all have to stand by themselves, but you're right. They all have to be chapters of one big, book. And it's, it's difficult because I think, especially with Netflix, um, we also have to take binging into consideration, which is very different than how I grew up watching television. Um, and by the way, still not how I watch television. I do not generally binge. I may watch two episodes in a night, but I know my attention span. So it's at some point I've got to turn it off. But when we're editing the Witcher, for instance, we're always thinking about how do we make the story feel satisfactory at the end while still leaving just that tiny little thing that you're like, Oh, okay. Five seconds. I'm just going to let you roll into the next episode. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, I think there are episodes that are more successful than others. I'm certainly still like learning how to do it, but you also can have episodes that I think, and this is different than broadcast is you can have episodes that feel a little bit more standalone within that eight, uh, eight episode arc, you know, because you've trusted your audience to be along on that journey. I believe that if they're watching eight episodes in one weekend, that if they get to episode six and it feels slightly different, if it's a little bit more emotional say, or if it is a slightly more romantic episode than a action filled episode that they're willing to hang in there because they've already given so much and they've invested so much. I, I mean, I love writing television in this way. Um, I think it's really great. It would be so difficult for me to go back to, by the way, God bless writers who still write 22 episodes. Like I salute you. That is so, so difficult. <laughs> the last question before we wrap up is there a lesson you've learned over the course of your career that you, you know, wish you could get, go back to that person who's just starting out, just answering phones for the West Wing and tell that person? Yeah. I mean, but it's a real, it's a real personal one. You know, it is about, I'm 43 years old now. And I feel like this is the first show that I've ever run. I came to the Witcher (laughs) having never done the show running job before. And it was a big job to, to start out on. And so I spent a lot of season one, especially trying to prove myself, trying to sort of prove that I deserve to be there, that I deserve to get this, this enormous epic tale from Netflix. And that, you know, I, uh, that they wouldn't regret their choice. And the truth is, is I so wanted to prove myself that I was determined to do a lot myself and kind of pulverized myself into dust on the ground. And then was helpful to no one. (laughs) So I think, you know, what I really learned and I think got a lot better at in season two is starting to balance my life and work a little bit more, you know, making sure that I had a, a team set up again, that was passionate and in love with their jobs and didn't rely on me to do everything. In fact, they didn't need to because they're that amazing at their own jobs, really empowering other people by empowering them and not making myself an inherent part of every single process, not having to say yes or no to every single thing that passes by. Um, but in fact, empowering other people to do that. I have, I think, created a better show because everyone is a lot more energetic. No one is trying to turn their entire lives over to making it. I think I have uh, allowed the people that work with me to really become better at their jobs um, and to gain more confidence and satisfaction in what they're doing, which I think shows on screen. And I'm, I mean, I'm still tired. I was going to lie and say I'm not as tired, No, I'm exhausted. but I feel like I am much happier with the shape of my life as well. Spending time with my kids, my family, um, and making sure that when I do turn back to writing a script, say I'm approaching it from a not exhausted, you know, mind addled place, but an energetic, excited one. So to me, it's really about trying to find that balance and letting yourself off the hook. I, I love that. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for taking the time to chat and congrats on the show. And I hope everybody watches the new season of The Witcher. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. 
Thanks again to Lauren Schmidt Hisrick for coming on the show. You can catch The Witcher right now on Netflix. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about new episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and on Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This podcast was produced by Kayla Guest and co-produced by Emma Vranich. Editing is by Sean Bonnet. Music is by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Thank you.